Welcome to the Christina Crooks Show, where you not only get to know the many versions of moi, but also the rich tapestry of humanity. I invite you to bring your full curiosity and listen as we journey through people's stories and expertise. I hope you walk away with insights and inspiration and new possibilities bubbling up inside of your soul. The reason it's called the Christina Crooks Show is because here's the thing. I don't always want to do the same thing. I like a variety in my life. I like to explore different rabbit holes and different people and different interests. So together in this podcast, that's exactly what we'll do. Have fun and we'll see you soon. I am joined today with a friend of mine that I know from Facebook, and we have yet to meet in person, but we've been friends for about two years now, a fellow coach and entrepreneur, Mike Harris. Mike is a professional coach, entrepreneur, and adventurer whose mission is to guide people all over the world to discover their own form of radical freedom. His pursuit of radical freedom has led him through a number of careers, including pool hustling, professional poker, and corporate finance. Mike lives in rural New Jersey and spends his free time hiking and secretly competing with other Peloton riders. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me, Christina. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. It's always a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Likewise. There's so many directions we can go. We'll go in all the the pockets of life that we go into. And one of the coolest things that I have always thought about you, besides the fact that you are so incredibly easy to talk to. So for anyone looking for a coach, Mike is amazing. One of the best I know. And you were a professional poker player. Tell us, tell us one of your favorite stories, most interesting stories of that journey. So I'll tell, I'll tell you a story that in hindsight, I, I'm not particularly proud of, but it gives a lot of context around, around a lot of what I do. I was dead broke when I started playing poker. I had just, I'd come out of bankruptcy. I think I was 25 years old, um, ran up all kinds of debt, couldn't pay it off, worked in restaurants. And after 9-11, the, the restaurant business just, slowed down a lot and I ended up going bankrupt. So one night I was working at this lousy Mexican restaurant behind the bar. I'm wiping down the bar. I see the world series of poker on TV and these guys are slinging around all kinds of money and wearing sunglasses inside hideous bowling kind of shirts that no one would ever wear anywhere else in public. And I thought that is the life that I want for myself. That looks like a lot of fun. That's it right there. That's, that's it. (laughs) Well, well, except for the hideous shirts. Yes. And and I, when I decide I want to do something, I just throw myself at it. So month after month, I was putting money in online and going down to Atlantic city. I live about an hour outside of Atlantic city, New Jersey. I, would take what I had and eventually I would go broke and I was getting better, but I was still losing. I, w- I hadn't, I hadn't quite cracked the code yet. And there, there was something in there for me about doing whatever it takes. And I, I, I felt like playing in Atlantic city, especially that I was, I, I had this complex that I was soft compared to everyone else. And, and in a way I am, I'm a, I'm a soft hearted guy. I'm not like the kind of guy who, who wants to get one over on you. And this one night I'm playing in this game and I'm winning a little bit and I'm feeling good and I get involved in this hand. And so a little context for the non-poker players out there, poker is essentially your aim in poker is to make the best five card hand. And if you don't think you're going to, you can fold, but if you're going to stay in the hand and you know, put your hand on display, put it up against the other hands that stay in, you're going to, you're going to keep betting and paying. I got into this hand and we built this huge pot up and I had two pair. The dealer lays out the last card, the community card that we're all sharing. And it puts a pair on what they call a pair on the board, meaning 
that if my opponent just had a single high pair, that he would have made two pair as well and would have beaten me. That's what I thought he had. This was a big pot and I wasn't willing to lose it. So I decided I was going to engineer this in a way that I could get him to fold his hand without, without showing it. Hmm. Or actually to, to get rid of his hand without showing it if he, if he ended up calling my bet. So I bet he throws in his money and I flip my hand up. I have two pair, eights and sixes. And so I look at the third pair on board and I spike my hand on the table defiantly. And I say three pair and instinctively he throws his hand into the dealer, relinquishes his hand and then realizes what he did. Now in poker, this is called an angle shot. It is the kind of thing that gets you beat up in the parking garage later that night. I am fortunate that that did not happen. And that was how my poker career started. I never did that again. Never did that. I felt like such, like such a dick for doing that. Why would that be something that gets you beat up? Like what's wrong with that? Well, it's not, it's sort of the, the line between legal and ethical. Mm, in what way? I don't well, know poker and I would guess that there's probably a lot of other people that, that don't. So yeah. Right. Well, essentially, I've coerced my opponent into throwing away his hand by lying about my hand at the showdown. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Yeah. So you, what you stated out loud was not actually what you had. Correct. Got it. I had two pair, not three pair. Three pair is not a poker hand. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I was thinking three of a kind. So that's probably also what he heard, right? Might have. Yeah. And my my intent was to signal that I had a hand that would beat whatever he had. And if he heard three, maybe he would think three of a kind. And so. Got it. I, I see why that's. Uh, what happened. And I mean, he was furious. He was furious. I mean, I, I, I don't know that I would have done that to someone who looked a little tougher than that guy. But, <laughs> but I, I didn't I didn't feel good about it. I see why that's and, um, dancing on the ethical line. Yes. And from there, like, I, not only did I never do it again, but I made, like, I made it a point to, to be ultra ethical because as much as I wanted to do whatever it took, it was like, I, I started to see where that line was and how dangerous it could be to walk on it. Not just for me, but just as a, like, where else will I go from here? Right. Well, and I think, and we can put a pin in this and come back to it because I have some more questions about this experience. When we ask that question anywhere in life, it was yes. not really a question, but when we make that statement, I'll do whatever it takes. Then the question becomes, will you, whatever it takes, is that true at any cost? And especially as coaches, we're always looking for at those kinds of questions. Is that true? Do I really want to do it at any cost? No. Where's my self-care? Where's my ethical line? Where's my, how am I impacting others? Those, those kinds of things. So I want to put a pin in that. And I just wanted to mention it and highlight that that's a really cool life lesson that you had because that was before you were coaching, right? Yeah. I was, I was only about 25, 26 at the time. Gotcha. Yeah. So was that your first, uh, your first big win in poker? That, that was, yeah. And I never looked back from that. Like I, like I never went broke again. Um, oh. I went, I mean, that was, that was the bottom of the J curve. Got it. You just start winning from there. I started winning ferociously. And why do you think that is? Uh, I would, I would venture to say that at that time of my life, I might have described myself as someone who is a loser who always no matter what would be overcome by circumstances. And in that moment, I saw that I had a choice that even barring the, the ethical implications of, of some of these choices, I could trust myself to make a choice that is not aligned with this image I had designed for myself, that I was a person who 
was an air quotes loser, a person who would be overcome by circumstance at every turn. Mm. So it upended a limiting belief that you had held at the time. It, it steamrolled it. Got it. How much did you win in that first hand? Uh, it wasn't even a lot of money. It was, I think, three or four hundred dollars. Oh wow! It wasn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't a big win. It was the first domino. Got and, it. And that. And and had I lost that hand, I would have. I would have gone home broke that night. So it was the first piece of really restoring confidence in yourself. Yeah. Or creating it in the first place. Yeah. It. It. Yes. It was a. It was the the first step in creating a lot of confidence in myself around that. Hmm. And did you, between then and now, I get that's, that's a span, <laughs> but between then and now, have there been moments where you've questioned that again, especially when it comes to money? Because so many people, and you know, because you're a coach, so many people have stuff around money. So many people have stories around money, limiting beliefs around money, scarcity around money. So have you bumped up against that again in your adult life? And if you have, how did you deal with it? It's, it's always been an ongoing practice for me. It always has. Um, I, I grew up with, with a lot of stories around money that, that were not productive, that we, that we never had enough, that money is something, in, in my family, money is something we use to compare ourselves to other people. And if, and if we have less, they're assholes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Judge the people that have what we don't have. Judge, judge the people who, who have more money. Um, and, and the people who, who have less, they are to be pitied. Mm. So I, I always find myself dancing with those judgments where it's, it's been this ongoing practice. When I transitioned from playing poker to working a, a nine to five career. I mean, dramatic difference between having 30, 50, a hundred thousand dollars in a shoebox under your bed <laughs> and, and walking around with, with all kinds of cash all the time and having this sort of high roller mentality and lifestyle and collecting a direct deposit paycheck every couple of weeks. And when you're about to go out to dinner, you hit the ATM for a hundred or $150 or something. Right. So and there's, is that, is that when you went into financial services? Yeah. And what was that experience like? So I'd, uh, I checked, I'd essentially checked out of poker, uh, for, for a lot of reasons. One was that it had the, the shift to online poker was strong and I, I played a lot of online poker, but as, as you might imagine, uh, people behind the veil of anonymity will, will say terrible, terrible things. It, but online poker was essentially Twitter before Twitter. And the game shifted a little bit where it became a little less easy money, where pl the poker literature, literature exploded. And I, I didn't have as much of an edge over the field as, as I used to. It seemed like it would be a good time for me to stop even though I had a lot of confidence in my own abilities, one of the financial things that is real in poker is variance, the, the up and down swings that are due to, to luck or due to running into another skilled player. And a, a veteran player once said, you will run worse and for longer than you ever imagined possible. That's true. And it, it takes a toll on you. It will take a toll on, on one's mental health. You lose for three months straight. You're, you're going to question everything. Right. So you, that, would, you would pull the parachute cord before it got to that is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Got it. And, and so, yeah, the, the transition was, it, it was difficult for me because I'm resistant to structure in a lot of ways. I hear that. I, yeah. So <laughs> I like if, if there's going to be structure in my life, I want to be choosing it. And so now I'm going to work for someone else. I'm not choosing the structure. Right. And so I, I feel like some form of my identity has been stripped away. And I had a lot of work to do around that to make peace with the idea that, hey, there are some things in my life right now that I'm not going to be naming the terms on. That this isn't 100% 
what I want it to be, but I'm here for a reason. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes in, in the corporate world, I didn't even know what that reason was. I want to pause you right there because I'm curious at this point in your story, how did trust and spirituality come into play at that point in your life? Or was it not in play yet? It really wasn't in play very much. I would say that spirituality has always been an element in my life in the sense that I have always lived from possibility. Mm. I always sensed that there was something beyond what I knew, what I understood. And I'm always running toward that. That's why I asked you that at this particular moment, because going from being a, a high profile poker player and then realize, okay, I don't have the same edge that I do. I'll go, I'll go back to work, but having parts of it that you didn't particularly like, like someone else running your schedule and creating a lot of the rules, going from this really kind of wild west environment to a much more structured, especially in corporate environment and in finance, that's like some of the most structured you can get. Right. And what I hear in, in knowing you personally, and in this conversation, I hear trusting, okay, let me check this out for a while because there's some possibilities over here for whatever reason. Yeah. And, and uh, self-trust is one of the big things that I picked up in my, my years playing poker. Before that, I would have gone and gotten a, a job and felt 100% victimized by it. Mm. Even, even with my understanding of possibility, like there was, in one sense, I saw that there was possibility within me, but I also saw that possibility existed outside of me. And I always struggled to reconcile those two. And that would end up leading me to take risks, to act impulsively, to act out of integrity. Did you ever, when you were playing poker, did you ever go down the road of betting too much and putting yourself at risk? It's like gambling addiction status. Did you ever get to that point? No, no. As a younger guy, I had done that a little bit. I had nights where I would go to the casino and gamble and, and lose all my money and not not know how I was going to buy ramen the next day or something like that. But once once it became a living and I learned how to win and I learned how it worked, I never I never really felt like I needed to go down that road again. There were times where I chased other things for a little while. I got caught up in chasing status in the game where I wanted to I wanted to be known. And then I realized once I started to get a little known, I realized this is for the birds. I don't want to be known. I don't, not in this. And, and that's kind of, been, that's become an edge for me over the years as a coach where, like we talked about before, my, my business has been referral and invitation and introdu you know, mutual introductions and things like that. But I have... I'd become so accustomed to flying under the radar that it is an edge for me to get myself out there, to actually take the, the responsibility for getting myself out there. Hmm. So let's, let's fast forward through the corporate time. Cause now I want to get to when you discovered coaching and you came into that. So you've, you've yeah. been a coach for 14 years now, 15. No, no, not quite that long since, since 2015. So, oh, okay. This, gotcha. So this is your, this is your eight for me. Gotcha. You're eight. I, I was just adding years on. <laughs> so you're eight. So how did you discover coaching and what now I know there's like a million ways you can answer this. So I'm excited to hear your answer. How much of what you learned in, in playing pool and which we didn't talk about here because I know that you have a million stories about pool hustling, which is just a whole other fascinating set of stories. But we'll we'll stick with just the the professional poker playing right now. What did you learn from that experience? Because I know it's a lot of body language and facial reading and seeing who might be bluffing and what people's tells are. Like there's a lot of psychology involved when you're playing high stakes poker. So how does that influence? So how did you find coaching? How did you come into it? 
what made that an absolute yes for you and made you see possibility there? And how did your poker playing experiences influence that? How Mm. does it continue to influence it? So I found coaching in 2014. Um, I I shouldn't say I found it in 2014, but I became really intrigued by it in 2014. I'd, I'd known of the coaching profession for a little while by then. I, I worked for a financial firm that that brought in executive coaches, and I'd uh, I'd never actually had the experience of working with a coach. But in 2014, I was in a Facebook group with a guy named Rich Litman, author of The Prosperous Coach with Steve Chandler, and he was in this group for maybe a month or two months, and he made a few posts in the group, and I was really struck by what he wrote what he had to say and how he told the story around it. I was, I was so struck by how direct he was, by how intentional he was with his language. And here I'm working in finance. I am burned out at this point. Like there, there is nothing left in the tank. I'm, I'm miserable and I'm looking for a change in my life. And so I did what, very busy people tend to do. I took his posts and I bookmarked them and said, I'll come back to them later. And I did in about 18 months. (laughs) But you still came back. (laughs) I I still came back. Uh, So I, I, I had to, I had to burn out a little more before I said, all right, this is enough. And I just, I was on a, I was on a little hiatus. I think I took three weeks off one summer in the summer of 2015. And a couple things happened. One, I came back to Rich's writing, I bought The Prosperous Coach and I found myself even more drawn in. And I also went to public speaking training. I know the company has changed names a few times now, but the training used to be called Own the Room and they're headquartered near New York. And I went to a New York training and it was you know, me and a, a million other uh, corporate executives in there. And each one of us received a brief, but very effective for me, at least, uh, executive coaching session. I was so struck by the experiences. I'm like, I would love to be on the other side of the table. I would love to do this. This is, this is something I've always dreamed of doing being someone's secret sauce, the secret weapon they keep in their back pocket. I mean, that was so intriguing to me. And so I dove back into the prosperous coach and I said, okay, self, how do we get started here? And I just decided to start offering free sessions. I did that for a little more than a year before, uh, before anyone paid me. I did wow. probably about, I probably did about three or 400 free two hour sessions before anyone ever paid me anything. Got it. And what was, what was that experience like? Well, it was, it was a lot like, It was a lot like starting out in poker in that I, I made a lot of mistakes. I was very clumsy. The one thing I had going for me was that I had a great baseline of skills. I am a very, a very attuned listener that that might be the only thing I would ever tell anyone I am an expert in is listening. And like you pointed to before the, the skills that came from, from poker and pool, it's not just listening, but hearing what's going on around what's being said or, and what's being intentionally conveyed, what's being unintentionally conveyed. And I would guess what is also not being said. Correct. Especially that. Right. I found that to be a little more nuanced, but something that I right. grew into pretty quickly. And you and I have talked a lot about different, different things in coaching because we both really value coaching and treat it as sacred. And I, I came into it in a similar way where I didn't, the experiences I had had uh, peripherally with coaches was nothing exceptional until I found my coach that ended up training me. And I went, oh, oh, this is what it's really about. And this was someone that, and for those of you that haven't listened, he's episode one of the podcast, that's Hans Phillips. And he was incredible. He was just incredible, not because of what he had to say. He was 
very rarely giving advice. It was more of what he would ask and what he would get me to explore within myself and the actions I would take by him going, you got this. So what do you do next? And he really trusted that I had the answers for things. And I went, wow, this is really powerful. And at that point for me, I had been in a lot of business development and sales roles. So I was working with a lot of small business owners, like brick and mortar, small business owners. And what was the, the part that was the most fun for me was inspiring them and empowering them to take whatever the next step for them was. So it was a natural transition. So I can really relate to how you found yourself being pulled into this industry because when you have a powerful coach, it makes all the difference in the world. And it's not about what they're doing. It's about what they inspire in you and the possibility that arises and bubbles up inside of you. And what I'm really enjoying about hosting this podcast is I know a lot of coaches <laughs> and, you know, for people that want to explore different styles, like we all have our own little flavor, you know, like we're all a little bit different. And I, for, for our listeners, one of the things I love about Mike is he's, he can really sit powerfully and hold space. I know you're here and now I'm talking about you in third person, but for, for the people that are just listening and not seeing us, <laughs> I find myself whenever we have a, a time that we connect and catch up that I end up telling him all these things that are happening in my life. And I'm like, you just pull this out of me because you just sit and listen. <laughs> and it's awesome. But we also will laugh and, and play with things. There's a game that we play that, that we might go over. We'll, we'll see if we get there. The fuck you, thank you game, which is just my favorite. But that's definitely your style. Like you powerfully hold space, but you also are very uh, down to earth and, and can relate to things in life. So on this journey that you've had through through high stakes poker and then through the corporate world and then moving into coaching. And now you're even entering into kind of another variation because you have a woodworking business. So tell us about that new, that new addition. So I, I start I started woodworking about 15 years ago and it, it wasn't, it wasn't really an intentional process. I wasn't looking for a, for a hobby or anything. I moved into a house and it was a money pit. And I had I had done no carpentry in my life at all, zero. And three months after we moved into this house, literally within a week, both uh, the interiors of both of our bedroom closets just kind of fell apart. And so now we've got like poles and clothes on the floor. And I'm like, I can't, I can't live like this. I, I didn't even really have a, a support system to figure it out. YouTube wasn't really a thing yet with all the how-to videos. I just went and bought some tools and started figuring shit out. <laughs> and it was ugly. I hear I mean, a theme here. Yes. This, this is my life. <laughs> well, with the, yeah, with the, with the poker and then with the coaching and you just start figuring it out. Just start. Just start. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't fucking matter. Look, I went to college. I got my degree. I go, I go work in finance. I am abnormally, uh, abnormally skilled in mathematics and all sorts of other things that are useful in finance. And I show up on day one and I don't know shit. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. I might as well, like, I might as well be swimming in the middle of the Pacific with nothing in sight, but that's where you can figure some stuff out. So I bought these tools and it's, it's sink or swim. And for me, a, a lot of bobbing above and below the water level. So after I started fixing things in my house, I thought, you know, it would be really, it would be really cool to make something beautiful out of this. And I bought magazines and started to learn how to do things and bought more tools and more tools and really upset my wife with the number of tools I was buying, filling our basement with. Those, those woodworking tools are expensive. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to tell me. 
<laughs> if 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 I if I told you what what I've what I've put into my new shop, your head would spin. Oh, I know that you do professional work, and you've been bringing in a lot of business. So I can only imagine <laughs> what you've invested in tools. Yeah. So about five years ago, my wife and I had separated, and I was figuring at that point that I would be moving to the West Coast, and I wasn't going to be able to bring all my tools with me. So I sold the whole thing off and stopped woodworking. And not long after that, we got back together and moved into a new house. And there wasn't really, not really any feasible way for me to do it here. So I, I had a few years off. My wife opened a store with her sister last year and they hired a contractor to build all this stuff for them. And the day before he's supposed to start, he's, they struggled to find a, another contractor. Everyone was so busy during the, during 2021 with, you know, COVID projects and stuff like that. Their contractor said, I'm not going to be able to come do the job. I have COVID. Wah, and wah. Wah, wah. <laughs> so they said, well, what are we going to do? I said, well, here, I'll make a, I'll make a list of, of tools that you guys can buy. Um, I'll do the work. I get to keep the tools. Oh, and it wasn't nice. Tools. And, um, and so I, I did some building for them and then people started to come into the store and ask, Oh, who built that? That's really nice. And that was how I got started. I had, you know, a few months later, I started rebuilding the shop in earnest, rented a space and got to work. Like I was telling you in the, in the pre-show, a lot of why I keep doing this is that it's a practice in self-forgiveness Yes. because. And I love that. I love that. So yeah. tell us what that means for you. Well, I'm, I'm a person who's used to figuring things out in short order and not really getting a whole lot of resistance along the way. This is something that requires a lot of intentional effort for me to get right. So every single project I work on, and I, I really hope some of my clients are, are going to listen to this because they'll get a kick out of this. Every single project, I mess up in some way. Some more significant than others. But I mean, I mess up a lot of stuff to forgive myself because I have to keep going and I have to learn to trust myself. So forgiveness is, is a bridge to trusting myself that, yeah, you, you failed this time. You really, you really messed that up badly, but you, you can figure it out. Like you'll work it out. And this is, this is salvageable. I'm, like, I'm not even kidding you. Like, two days ago, I have this very expensive table I'm building for someone. And I sanded a crater into it. Now, if the theme for the table were the moon, we'd be good, but it's not. <laughs> so now I'm number one. I'm like, holy shit. What am I going to do about this? And I'm always like, I'm like, what the fuck did you just do to this thing? Man, like, you are fucking up. And I had to pause myself and say, no, look, this is, this is okay. What you did was, I mean, it wasn't the correct outcome, but you, you didn't do something egregious or, incorrect it's it happens sometimes mistakes happen right. sometimes we don't get the outcomes we want you know we've we've created this kind of idea that if you know right process right outcome it, it doesn't work that way all the time you know right the right process is is a great guide but in the end you're you're gonna mess stuff up. Things are gonna go sideways, and that's when that's when the real test comes. Can can you can you forgive yourself? That's that's resilience right there. Right, I mean, and that's a really good point with self forgiveness leading to resiliency. So for our listeners, how do you build resilience? What's your practice for resilience? Do you have a practice for self forgiveness or resilience? Cause that's, I think that's a really interesting question to ask ourselves. I know I'm thinking about that right now, as you're talking about woodworking and I can see that when I do household projects with, with my honey, because I am terrible at it. <laughs> I'm 
kind of lazy when it comes to household projects. I don't like them. And he is very, very particular and very precise. And so he's kind of expecting me to match him, but I don't, I don't even know what tool you're asking me for. So can you draw me a picture or like, <laughs> is there a cartoon I can watch? Like, What's happening? But you put me in front of people to understand behavior and understand language. And that's a whole different world for me or creativity. So uh, when we're talking about self-forgiveness and resilience, this is where it is for me. It's being a beginner, being willing to be a beginner over and over and over and over because it humbles you. When you're a beginner, you suck. You suck. And Mm -hmm. when you're okay with sucking and looking foolish and looking like you don't know what you're doing and willing to work through that and and keep building on the skill it really builds resilience for me yeah and and so much of life is made up as we go Uh, before we hopped on this call i was thinking about the idea of expertise and how how much appetite there is for expertise a lot of people who i speak with the first time they say well what what, what is your area of expertise? And my snarky response is not being an expert because I, I don't really feel like I am an expert in anything but listening. The transfer of knowledge is useful, but it's formulaic. You know, if, say, for example, you've got someone who is training in surgery they know the protocols and the procedures for specific types of surgeries, but knowledge and understanding comes from the experience of being in a process when something doesn't go as planned. Right. We all desire expertise, but really what it is, is we want someone we can trust to figure it the fuck out when everything goes sideways. Yeah. I have a couple questions here and then we'll begin to to wind down our time together. I have a lot of people around me that are entrepreneurs and creatives. And it's an interesting combination. I think that we both identify in part of that. Like you do a lot of very creative things, but you're also an entrepreneur. And they tend not to put people in a box. Creatives hate being put in a box, but we like freedom and we like choices and we like to be able to do what is in front of us that inspires us. So with that said, what advice would you give to that demographic of people or people that identify as creatives, especially the ones that are trying to make their art, whatever that art is, whether it's coaching or a business or painting or singing, whatever that creative art form is into a business, how do they build self-forgiveness and radical freedom and financial freedom around all of that while building their skill set and building their business. Oh, that's a good one. I, I, I will say what has worked for me is one, you, you're not going to do it alone. It, it takes a village to create that. Personally, I, I lean on my community, my local community, my friends and my family for, for support around that. And they've really been wonderful and helped lift me up into a place where I am making things that I love to make in a way that I love to make it. Mm. And, and another is be honest with yourself about your thresholds with respect to doing work for cash versus doing sexy work, doing the exciting work. Because building a business invariably leads to doing some some pretty unsexy things. Yeah. It is not always glamorous. It's, no, it is not. It's often not glamorous. <laughs> it, it is not. And so know what your thresholds are for that. And get, get as much support as you can around those things. Because, I mean, personally, the creative projects I have no problem at all with. If it's organizing things, if it's scheduling, logistics, anything like that, I lose interest pretty quickly. It it drains the life out of me. And sometimes I need someone to come in and say, 
look, you need to do X, Y, and Z to move forward with building this business. You need to do this on Instagram or do that on the social media, do this to get the word out. Because especially if you're working by yourself, the lines between working in your business and working on your business can feel really blurred sometimes. Yes. And you tend to wear many different hats. Yes, often all of them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. See all these hats? They're all mine. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The last thing is, if you're looking to transform this into a business, let the selling of your art be a part of the art. When you're just presenting something and saying, hey, here it is. This is how much it costs. You've got a transaction. And transactions are essential for business. But what if you can up-level it to an experience? What if you can transform it into a connection? I do a lot of that in my work just for the sake of doing it. That doesn't, that does not keep my business afloat by any means, but little things like that, you know, as an example, this is pride month and my town does a, a pride celebration. And I thought, you know, I have all this material. I could make some mini pride flags that people could hang on their wall at home or hang in their business or whatever. And it's not a money maker or anything like that, but it just creates a little bit of connection, a connection between me and the person who wants the piece and maybe the person who wants the piece as a result, their life is moved. They feel a little more connected to some element of themselves. Right. And that's, that's it. People tend to think of sales and marketing as this very dry, like, like you're talking about transactional experience. Like this is what I have to offer and I'm looking for people to buy it, whether it's a service or a product or whatever it is. But when you make that whole process relational instead of transactional, and you can really connect through, through that whole process, it can change it. And I, I have an experience recently that relates to that with this very podcast. I, this has been a vision of mine for a few years and I've wanted to do it. And I would do the fun part. I would record the episode and then it would be go into the vortex of my computer. What I needed to do was edit it. I wanted to put out a thorough, well-done product, but I wanted to just already know that stuff. I didn't want to have to go learn it because I sucked at it and it was hard and there was a learning curve. But now I, I'm like, I'm going to have it out by June 15th, however it is. So that date really changed things. It made it very concrete. And as I went through the editing process, it actually started to become fun. And I started to go, oh, oh, I just figured out how to fade the music in. Oh, I just figured out how to add music. Oh, I just found this app that I can edit based on the text. So I'm not looking at the sound wave and it's so cool. And so when we can relate to things in our life differently, especially if we're running a creative business or a business that has some creative aspects to it, I know many people that are creating businesses around their art and their creativity. And there's this, there's a lot of expectation of the result. Like if I do this, then I'll get sales. If I do this, it'll be successful. And they're very attached to, cause they're putting everything into this work. And so it's very much like a part of them that they're putting out into the world. And when it's not getting the response they want, it's a personal attack. So what would you say to that? Check why you make what you make. And don't get me wrong. We, you know, we're all here making a living in some way, shape or form. But if you are showing up to move lives, are you moving lives in the way you want to move lives? Like that's like, you know, we can all go through the motions and follow the steps to the formula. And for some people, maybe it works and some people, maybe it doesn't. Some people have, you know, in, if we, if we want to break it down to a podcast, some people have a, a natural charisma that, that draws people in a natural way of being that draws people in. And some people have to find theirs. And 
if you really want to move lives and create whatever lifestyle arises from having genuinely brought people together, lifted people up, shown people possibility, given them whatever it is that you wanted to give them. If you're not doing that, try something else. Try, you know, try another road. Don't, don't fuck around and go through the motions. And that's one of the things that I, I really love about you, Mike, as a human being, like you really, I've always felt that from you, that you deeply care about your impact. You deeply care about what you provide to the world in how you show up and who you be. And so from me to you, I appreciate you in this moment Thank and you. every moment. And I, I want to move. I notice I use and as filler words. I'm just one giant run on sentence. <laughs> <laughs> That's my life. Um, but I really, I'm not quite ready to go yet, but I know we need to, we need to wind ourselves down here. But my very last question, I promise is the last one is you have been exponentially successful financially. So what advice would you give to entrepreneurs, to creatives, to anyone listening this, this episode for really moving forward in a way that, that they can create that kind of abundance financially and have that radical financial freedom that you've created for yourself? The, uh, the thing that comes to mind is the, there's a line from the Aerosmith song, Dream On, you have to lose to learn how to win. I think that you have to be willing to lose. You have to put skin in the game in order to really have success. But there's, there's a football coach who says, no risk it, no biscuit. It's so true. And that doesn't just translate to money. That translates to life. You know, in your relationships, if you are not risking any of yourself, if, you are, if there is a part of yourself you are not offering, you're missing out. You are, you are not going to get a, you're not going to get a great return. You're not, you don't give all of yourself. You're not going to get all of someone else. Can you distinguish the difference between it's interesting. I don't think I would normally ask this question, but I, I feel it right now in this moment. Can you distinguish the difference between an unhealthy risk versus healthy risk? Well, I think I would, I would say that a, a healthy risk is one I from which you're... a functional risk versus dysfunctional risk. That's really what I mean. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, I feel that. Um, so functional risk, essentially, Functional risk has some work behind it. Functional risk has a foundation, right? You are you are not betting what you can't lose or what you cannot recover from the loss of. And I, I say it in that way because emotionally we may feel like we cannot afford to lose something, but in relationship that which we are most afraid to risk is often a thing that we need to be willing to risk in some way, shape or form. Yeah. So a dysfunctional risk on the other hand would be something that you genuinely cannot afford to lose. I would say that dysfunctional risk applies more directly to a, uh, to financial risk. I imagine it could in relationships, but I think um, I feel, I feel like those are so nuanced that it would, I would, I would struggle to come up with a, with a pertinent example in this moment. Yeah, I, I hear you. And it definitely is in relationship. I wanted to highlight at least before we ended for today, that there is a distinction to be made in taking risk, especially when it's financial stuff. Any final thoughts around our conversation today or, or pieces that you want to leave with people and maybe how they can find you? Um, what do I want to leave people with? Ooh. Well, I'm um, just one one word we have not brought up thus far is commitment. Mm -hmm. And I often find that that commitment represents a gap 
between what we are doing and what we would like to be doing, how we are being and how we would like to be being. And I would encourage everyone to examine your own commitments. What is it that you're committed to right down to your very thoughts and beliefs? What is it that you're committed to that has you where you're at? And what would you like to commit to that would have you in a space you would want to be, that you would be elated to be in? Oh, that's, that's great, Mike. I, something I say to people a lot is we're always committed to something. So what are you committed to? And what do you want to be committed to? Yep. That's great. I wish we started with commitments. (laughs) (laughs) I told you, I was like, I'm not sure where we're going to go. Yeah. But we, we tend to pick on all these, these little parts of things. And I just, I love when we get to be in conversation and I wanted to highlight for our listeners who you are and give some context because you're in this little secret pocket of the world and you know they don't necessarily know you and they can't read about you online so we have to introduce you to this community yes and and then we can you know dive into these topics more as time progresses but thank you so much for being here mike and if someone is interested in reaching out to you more what's the best place for them to find you uh best place to find me is my website mikefharris.com that is mike f is in francis Harris dot com and uh if anybody is interested in reaching out to me just to you know for whatever reason my email is mike at mikefharris.com very creative i know (laughs) (laughs) and i will put those for those of you just listening and you want to be able to see it written there will be it will be in the description of this episode all of his links but i wanted you to hear it and um and is your woodworking on there as well um, yeah, my woodwork, the best place to find my woodworking is on Instagram. I am at Canyon Rustic. Canyon Rustic. Yes. Perfect. I'll put that in the description as well. I synonymously have called that the show notes, which I've learned in the last few episodes. Those are not show notes. So if I've said show notes, you know, in the, uh, in the outgoing message that you'll get, I'm saying show notes and I mean episode description. So Big, big love, Mike. Thank you so much for being with us today. Christina, thank you again for having me. It has been a treat. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Christina Crooks Show. If you'd like to learn more about our guest, you can explore the show notes and there should be information about them in there. If you'd like to reach out to me personally, you can go to my website, christinacrooks.com and learn about different offerings we currently have or set up a call with me personally. I hope that you take away some insights and some new inspirations, some new zest for life. And I hope above all, you have a really great day.